Hello, my name is Tim Fidak. I'm the Curator of Geology with the Nova Scotia Museum. And uh, this is the showcase of Nova Scotia Fossils and Geology series, uh, where we're uh, providing uh, interviews with people doing interesting work in the geology of Nova Scotia. And these uh, recordings are available to grade 12 students uh, here in Nova Scotia. Um, and today I'm, I have a co-host, uh, Luke Allen from Citadel High School. So hello, Luke. Hey, Tim. And uh, it's a really great privilege uh, to have with us today, Gerald Glode uh, from the Mi'kma'wai DeBert uh, Center. And so hello, uh, welcome, uh, Gerald Quay. Oh, well, thank you very much. And um, yeah, I'm pretty excited to do this. That's good. Um, did you start with the Department of Natural Resources? Uh, yeah, straight out of uh, uh, community college there back in um, 1980. So okay. yeah, I've been around for a while. Yeah, and well, I did 25 years with the uh, Department of Natural Resources and okay. then was seconded to the uh, Office of Aboriginal Affairs. And uh, now I sit with the uh, Department of Education and again with uh, Mi'kmaq de Burt uh, Cultural Center. So you've got a yeah you've got a lot of experience. You've been uh, thinking about these things for a long time, uh, the relationships between uh, Mi'kmaq uh, stories and and story sites, uh, and, and the geology of the area. If we could get you to give a, your presentation, then maybe Luke and I can come back and, and ask you some questions or have a little discussion after that. Sounds like a plan. Uh, I'd like to say uh, my name is Gerald Glode, and I'm from the Mi'kmaq de Bird Cultural Center, which is part of the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq, and we are working on an archaeological project. It's uh, one of the oldest projects uh, archaeology finds in Canada, so we, we share that uh, distinguished uh, designation of being one of the oldest ones. It's uh, pretty good. Uh, these are some of the samples that we have. Uh, going back to the paleo period. Now looking at that main um, uh, projectile point uh, there in the middle, um, that's considered a Clovis point, uh, first found in Clovis, New Mexico. But when you see something that is done in that fashion, um, it goes back to a time period that is some nine to 14,000 years ago. And then after that, say seven to 9,000, they started to stem points and then five to seven, they started to notch the sides of the stems. And so there's been this transition of technology over the years and an archeologist is looking for these little telltale features that uh, puts it down to certain time frames. Um, again, uh, the project uh, was actually found, the archeological project was found in the town of DeBert. And if uh, those of you who are not familiar with the name of that little town, it's pretty well smack dab in the middle of the province. I myself am from uh, Toro Heights, just a part of Toro, and uh, the Millbrook First Nation community. And uh, we're only about 20 kilometers away from the archaeological site in the town of DeBert. Uh, it was found on an old military base. And uh, when I was on the internet, I'm thinking, well, what if I Google um, Camp DeBert, like 1948? And uh, this is literally what popped up was a postcard from there. And uh, just sort of takes us to that different time just to put it into perspective. Uh, the first archeological um, pieces or artifacts that were found were found in an old um, recreational field. And what they were doing was they were preparing an area that for the soldiers that were getting ready to go to World War II. Uh, they were being trained at Camp de Burt. And they wanted to make a soccer field and a softball field for them. So they plowed off this area. And when they plowed off this area, they exposed some artifacts that were underneath. And uh, it was actually the dean of the agricultural college in um, Bible Hill. Him and his wife were in the area picking blueberries. These um, blueberry pickers that were picking actually found some of the first artifacts. One of those very first artifacts was the Clovis Point. And Mr. Ernest Eaton, the Dean of the Agricultural College, he had a bit of a background in archeology, span so he knew it was quite significant. And um, the, because Canada had a higher priority and that was the war effort, the archeological dig didn't take place till 1960s. Uh, you got Dr. George McDonald there with a cap on um, in the dig in the 60s with uh, his crew 
And this image actually depicts two things. One is the sandiness of the soil, a lot of that being glacial debris from um, the glaciation. And the, another thing is the depth of the living soil we're going down and digging under to 50 to 100 centimeters. And that's where the living floor was. Uh, these artifacts have uh, been coming out of sites at Dem uh, Camp de Burt. We have several fire hearths that we have there. And in the fire hearths, we can get accurate radiocarbon dating. And there's a period of like a thousand years of occupation. Some of the material is 10.1 thousand years ago. Other is 11.1 thousand years ago. We use the average of 10.5 thousand years ago. And these are radiocarbon dating dates. When you actually convert that to actual calendar years, it translates to some 13,300 years ago. And again, when you're looking at these artifacts, uh, these ones are, a lot of them are drills. Um, they're drills that are made for drilling holes in um, bone or stone or wood. And um, the material that they're made from talks about the geological inventory here in the province of Nova Scotia. A lot of semi-precious jewels being used that have a hardness on the scale of say eight to eight and a half, nine or even nine and a half. So this material um, uh, is like uh, John Calder says, the Mi'kmaq were the first geologists in Nova Scotia. <laughs> so looking at these artifacts, you can see the significant material they have. These ones being edge scrapers made out of agates and amethysts and for cleaning hides and preparing hides. Uh, to fashion into clothing or for other uh, materials. Uh, these ones themselves are a lot of agate and chalcedony um, bone wedges. And what you're doing is um, you're fashioning tools out of bone. You're using these little wedges to split the bone. So if you can imagine putting one of these wedges on a bone and smashing it with a larger rock, the only thing that's breaking is the bone. That there is the softest material in the formula. Uh, these things are very, very hard and they hold their edge very, very well. Uh, we're digging them up some 13,000 years later and they're just as sharp as the day that they were created. Uh, again, some of the pictures of the sites back in the 1960s. Um, they actually found some 4,600 formal artifacts as well as 25,000 pieces of debris or debutage. And you see that image again of the Clovis Point underneath there is all these little chips. Now you cr you're creating this debris from taking a larger piece of um, stone and just snapping it off to the desired um, tool that you see inside. And again, those little pieces are all there. And that again refers to the geological inventory of the material that they were using. So the only thing that's left is the stones and those stones can definitely tell us so much in the stories. Um, the Department of Education back in the 60s was calling it an Indian arrowhead. Now, this thing is some four inches long and it's quite heavy. If you were to fashion it onto an arrow, it wouldn't fly very far and wouldn't hit very hard. And again, um, when you're talking about technology, 13,300 years ago, it predates bow and arrow technology. Bow and arrows have only been around to about six to 8,000 years ago depending on whether you're looking at African material or Chinese material. Um, the point that we had is actually a projectile point of the grandfather of the bow and arrow, and that's the atlatl and dart system. And again, it's a spear throwing device that has been used on six of the seven continents that we have. And you're using the science of um, stored spring energy in the very, very flexible shaft of the atlatl dart, which is some um, five to six feet long, and you're throwing it with a lever. Now, the technology was very, very effective. And today they still hold um, atlatl competitions. And the world record for an atlatl throw is 843 feet. So if you can imagine a football field or a soccer field only being 100 yards. So if you line three football fields uh, end to end, that's how far you can throw this uh, device. Again, you're throwing things farther, faster, harder, and stronger with very, very little effort. Uh, some of you may have some device like this at home for playing fetch with your dog uh, called a whippet or a chuck it. And again, using this science of leverage with a little flick of a wrist, you can throw that tennis ball quite a distance. Uh, we actually took this to the um, 
400th celebration of um, the Mi'kmaq, uh, sort of joining Christianity with the baptismal of the first Mi'kmaq back in 1610 in Grand Pre, Nova Scotia. We held an event and we reintroduced the community to the Adelaide and Dart technology. And we are saying that it doesn't matter what continent you come from, the, this was the tool of your ancestors. And uh, another thing is with the artifacts that we found, we actually found dry blood inside some of the cracks and crevices of the stone. And with an X-Acto knife, we scraped out enough um, uh, dry blood to get it sampled. Uh, we sent it off and it came back, uh, it tested positive as caribou kin. And a lot of people know what a caribou is, but a lot of people don't know that the word that we use for this uh, European reindeer, caribou, is a Mi'kmaq word. And a Mi'kmaq is a verb-based language and caribou means to shovel. And that's what the caribou do. They shovel the snow to get to the grasses and they get to the mosses underneath the snow. They have to shovel. So that's how he got his name. But again, it wasn't the blood of the caribou. It was the blood of caribou kin. So again, this here is our ancestor hunting his ancestor, which was the stag moose. Some 150 to 170% larger than the caribou that we have today, but definitely related to the caribou here as the megafauna back um, 13,000 years ago. And again, that age period of us moving into this area and settling is directly connected to the moving of the last glaciation. Uh, this is North America as we know it today. And some 13,000 years ago, the, the glacial ice, I guess reached uh, glacial maximum at some 14,000 years. It went all the way down into Wisconsin in the United States. And that's why it's called the Wisconsin glaciation. And that's when our people first moved in here. As things started, temperatures started to warm, the ice fields were starting to retreat farther north. Uh, things were warming up, vegetation was kicking in, animals were moving in for the vegetation and the people followed the animals. And even if you take a look on Google Earth and you look outside into the Atlantic, you can see the scars that were left by the glaciation. That little ledge that we have is glacial maximum. And because the ice was so thick, you can see that the water levels were a lot lower. And you see those erosion channels and you follow it out to the end. That's where the water line would be. And as the water or the glaciers melted, the water rose uh, to get us to the shoreline that we have today. And again, our people settled here and that's all people are. People are where you come from. Um, Africans come from Africa, Chinese come from China, the French come from France. It's like uh, the Mi'kmaq. We come from a place called Mi'kma'ki, which literally translates to the land of the Mi'kmaq. Divided up into nine different districts, you can see on the map here, um, two of those districts were combined. So all of Newfoundland was combined with Cape Breton Island. And it was called Takamkokakunamagi. Then all of Prince Edward Island was combined with Anaganish and Picto County, and it was called Abigwada Picto. Now, again, looking at that verb based language, you see the words of Gespawik down in the valley. Um, that means land's end. You go down to the valley, you're surrounded by water all the way around. If you go up to the Gaspe Peninsula of um, Quebec, which is still part of our territory, it's Gespawik. Gespawig and Gespawek are almost the same because they almost say the same thing. Gespawek means the end of our land or the end of our territory. If you go farther than that, you're running into the Mohawks and the Iroquois. So that's that verb-based language. Uh, Pictuk. Pictuk in the verb-based language means the place where ground gases erupt. And sure enough, in that area of Picto County, um, you take a look at the geological inventory of that place, uh, you see the little shark fin just before the Canso Causeway. Uh, it's full of volcanic fault lines. And it still moves and rolls and rumbles even today. And um, we have a, a character in our stories. He's called Japichkum, the great horned serpent. Whenever he moves, the ground shakes. Uh, the zigzag patterns in the ground that are cracked are like his slithering path. And again, he has two horns, a red horn and a yellow horn that can be seen flashing from these cracks in the earth. 
And the final part of the story says, if you're unfortunate enough to hear the hissing of the serpent, that, that hissing sound like a snake, um, it would take away your ability to breathe and uh, you would perish. And what they were talking about was they were talking about land changes here in the province. Um, if the ground started to shake, we wanted our children to imagine this hideous creature underneath the ground, and we wanted them to run for their lives. If they saw the ground crack open, again, think of this monster and run to get out of there. Um, even seeing flashes from the earth, uh, just a couple of years ago when um, Hawaii had uh, their earthquakes, you could see the cracks in the earth and you could see the flashes of the liquid magma popping up. Uh, well, that's the way it was here in Nova Scotia. And the final stage of it is the hissing sound of the serpent. That's toxic gases being released from under the earth's crust. Coal fields, sulfur fields, different um, toxins that are coming from these cracks. If you inhaled or ingested any of this stuff, it could definitely kill you. So here we're taking a look in uh, Bay of Funde, and you can definitely see these places in Nova Scotia where lands have changed quite, um, quite drastically during our time period here. And um, these weren't things that happened like, you know, millions of years ago. A lot of these things happened in a more recent time, some 6,000 years ago. I could take us today and I could put us on a bus and I could take us to a beach, beautiful beach sand, beautiful beach grass. Uh, there's even shorebirds that nest there. But the thing about this beach is um, it's 150 feet in the air. And again, you can see under this photo here, you'd see the sandy beach on top and the black area that's underneath, that there's volcanic basalt. And when you look at the material that it was left behind, when you look at the water level or sea level, you can see that's where that ground definitely originated. And it was through plate tectonics and pressure being pushed that popped these areas here in Nova Scotia. And you've got what's called raised beaches. And some of these places have, um, done this just as recent as 6,000 years ago. Even when you take a look at the inventory of some of our stories, we talk about a story that has been passed on for generations where it's called the time the rivers flowed backwards. Now, if you can imagine water, water is liquid form runs downhill. You got a little stream that down, runs down into a creek, a little creek runs downstream into a brook, that little brook runs downstream into a river, and that river is going to run to where it meets the ocean on the shoreline. If you've got all of a sudden a raise at that shoreline level of 150 feet, water and would indeed run backwards. So these aren't just fictional stories that were created um, to amuse uh, the Mi'kmaq ancestors. Uh, they're actual occurrences of things that happened here during our time period and our occupation here. We had so many information of these um, legends and stories from uh, the Gloose Cap legends that have been collected by different ethnographers over the years. One of the most famous one, of course, is Mr. Silas T. Rand uh, was down in the Wolfville area. He was a Baptist minister that lived with the Mi'kmaq for 40 years, learned our legends, collected our practices and protocols, and recorded a lot of our stories. Uh, another ethnographer, uh, not as long ago, um, Mr. Uh, Wall Wallace and Wallace, I guess it was, uh, he, uh, he had gone out and written a book on, book on um, Mi'kmaq culture, and it was kind of um, false. There was a lot of stories that were put in there that just weren't accurate, and people were telling them things that just weren't true. So he sort of uh, lost a bit of his reputation after he published his book. So his wife and his son set out to correct that book. And they created a second book called The Mi'kmaq Indians of Eastern Canada. And the wife and son went out to correct uh, the um, ethnography and the stories of the Mi'kmaq people. But there are tons of different ethnographers that have written books on our people here, uh, known by different things. Uh, today we're Mi'kmaq, and um, before we used to be the Mi'kmaq. And before that, it's like, um, we were the part of the Algonquian family. We were a Northeastern woodland tribe. Uh, even the French during their occupation here before the expulsion of the Acadians in 1755, uh, they used to refer to us as the Siroquois. 
So when you're looking for information on Ligma, if you spell it with uh, the, the spelling method, method that we use today, uh, you'll, you won't find as much information as you do when you go back in history and you use all the different references that we were um, done by. Um, I found some 48 volumes of Blue's Cap Legends from the University of California. And we had an ethnographer here, Hoffman, who had written a series of books and had used a lot of these reference material. Uh, he was studying and he wrote his thesis here in the East Coast, traveled over to the West Coast and donated a lot of his library, his entire personal library to the University of California uh, later in his life. But uh, those books have been converted to um, digital files and they're available online from University of California. Uh, amazing collection of uh, material. One of the first jobs that I got when I started with the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq was to collect and read all the stories that we have. Um, and the important part was they were looking at locations. If a story gave us the name of a location, I had to mark it on a map. And what my boss was talking about was oral histories that have been passed on for generations. Uh, we still do it today. We use oral histories through storytelling to pass on information from the past. Uh, everything from our creation story of how Goose Cap was created by three bolts of lightning in the Bay of Funde. Uh, they said the first bolt of lightning gave him the shape of a man. The second bolt of lightning brought him to life, but he was still fas or fastened to the ground. And all he could do was to observe and learn. The third bolt of lightning set him free so he could actually go out and talk to the animals and the people and tell them how they were supposed to coincide here. Even the striking of uh, three bolts of lightning in the Bay of Funde Mud, <laughs> they say that's where we get our skin color from. <laughs> so that's part of our oral histories and stories as well. And even when it comes to the departure story of how Blue's Cap left our people, and again, off the cliffs of Cape Blomidon, where he went on the back of a whale. And as a gift for the whale, for taking him on this journey to new lands, uh, Gooscap gifted him his pipe. And that's why when you're out on a whale watch and you see that little, that little blow stem of the whale, that's actually uh, the story of, uh, uh, of Gooscap's pipe, the smoke from his pipe. Uh, another thing is one of the most famous Blue's Cap legends is the legends of five islands. And I say it's the most famous because it's been used since the 1930s as part of our interpretation of the uh, trail system that as we travel through uh, from the Bay of Funde on the north side and um, the south side of the Bay of Funde, we have what's called the Blue's Cap Trail and just totally full of stories. Uh, the three sisters up in Cape Chignecto where Three sisters were playing a prank on Goose Cap and were running off a moose that he was trying to hunt. And then when he found out what the sisters were doing, he turned them to stone. And they're still there off of uh, the rock formations off of Cape Chignecto. Uh, the legendary five islands where Goose Cap had thrown five sods of mud at a giant beaver. And again, even giant beaver is not a mythical character from our stories. Um, they found the remains of this animal here um, the Latin name is Castorides ohioensis, literally translates to giant beaver. And the four that they found here, they say that he died off about 8,500 years ago. And I'm thinking, no, he could have been around a lot um, more recent than that. And thinking about land changes of this thing along the coastline, and with coastal erosion, a lot of his habitat would be washed away. So, and so would the remains. So I'm thinking that he would be right around that five, 6,000 years. Um, age uh, for our stories. This is the incisor of Castorides ohioensis, and this is the skull of giant beaver compared to the skull of a uh, contemporary beaver that we have today. Uh, this guy was some seven feet tall and uh, uh, close to a thousand pounds, so he would be quite a considerable character and would be somebody that showed up in a lot of our legends and stories. Uh, this is probably one of the most prominent story sites that we have in our collection of legends. And I can literally tell you eight different legends about this one place. And that there is a place of Partridge Island, some two kilometers um, up from uh, the town of Parsboro. Uh, we have a story about Goose Cap making an amethyst necklace for his grandmother on that site. 
and that's site specific. If you go to Partridge Island, you will find amethyst. And our people were connecting this material, or collecting this material, and creating stone tools out of it. It's uh, very hard. And when you look at the collection of artifacts in our archaeology inventory, uh, it's all beautiful uh, gemstones. Uh, we have another story about Goosecap's grandmother uh, living on the island. That was one of her campsites. And just two kilometers across, or two miles across, is uh, Cape Lomadon. That was uh, one of Blue's Caps campsites. And then over to the other side, you see Cape Split, where he had two um, howling wolves. And he two, turned those to stone when he left uh, to watch out for his grandmother. So getting back to her magic cooking pot, she had a magic cooking pot that was never empty. If you cut off a piece of stew meat, it would just grow back. So she was always ready to receive company. And the thing is, this island is right on a volcanic fault line. And it's full of um, these uh, vesicular basalts. And it, the air bubbles are cooling in the water. And it's creating these um, air holes through the rock. You literally blow right through any of these holes. Uh, another thing is uh, the Saxby Gale back in uh, 1869, it deposited a permanent land bridge over the marshes there, and they hold air pockets as well. So what happens every day, twice a day, when the Bay of Funday tides come in, that's the highest tides in the world, the water rises and the water pushes the air out of these um, crevices and the air and the rocks, as well as the pockets that are in the, um, the, the displaced uh, debris that created um, that little land bridge. And what happens is the water boils and bubbles like a cooking pot. If you go to our Migmoy de Bert site, you can actually see video footage of uh, this event. And like I said, every day, uh, twice a day. But again, you go to Partridge Island, you're not going to find much about the Mi'kmaq. Everything's about the geology, especially in the Partridge area. Uh, the last paragraph on this basically sums it up. On the shoreline can be found rock and sediment ranging in origin from 300 to 175 million years ago. And among these materials can be found samples of nearly every mineral in the world. <laughs> so it's like, why travel the world collecting all these minerals when you can get them all in one place? These are some of the samples of the agates that you'll find uh, littering the beaches of um, Partridge Island. This is just out on like a couple hour hunt. You can find the varieties, all the different colors. Uh, again, our people weren't interested in the monetary value of the stones. We we're talking about the stones that were created uh, to give us tool stones. Now, this here is a piece that used to be a sandy beach at one time. Now, if you take sand and expose it to high heat, you get glass. And if you take a sandy beach and expose it to high heat, you're going to get volcanic glass. That heat source is behind my son Kyle there. You see the volcanic basalt coming up at the, in the water there. That was liquid rock and the heat transferred that sandy beach into um, volcanic glass. And it's very, very desirable for making tools. You take a look at the enlarged uh, part of my son's finger, you can see the concordal fractures that are there in the stone. And, um, that's what you're looking for when it comes to desirable material for fashioning um, tools. And again, it breaks predictably. And if you know where it's going to break and how to break it, depending on the angle that you hit it, you can create some amazing tools. People still use it today. Uh, a lot of crafters, a lot of hobby people do something called flint napping, uh, making knife blades or spearheads or arrowheads, uh, even necklaces and earrings just for jewelry. But our answers were definitely using those for practical purposes. Uh, we had this project called the Lithic Sources Project. And what we were talking about was the place where these rocks originate from. We took all of our material to a man called Mr. Eldon George from the Parsborough area. And he definitely knew his rocks. I literally had the opportunity to work with this man over a 28-year period. And he taught me a lot. So he worked with us for years. Mr. Eldon George, uh, when my son and I used to go out collecting samples from all over the province, we'd go to his shop. And as soon as he saw the stone that I had in my hand, he told me where I picked it up at. 
and 28 years he was never wrong. <laughs> so that shows that intimate knowledge of the geology of Nova Scotia. And uh, he, um, he's a man who has uh, made major contributions to the geological inventory map of Nova Scotia. In fact, I do believe the printed map is dedicated to Mr. Eldon George. And what he had done was he took the sample artifacts we had, identified the material, and then told us where we were going to find this. Now, there's Mr. Eldon George with the red bed backpack. You got uh, Mr. Roger Lewis, who is the provincial ethnographer for the Nova Scotia Museum of Natural Resources in Halifax. And the other person that you see in the photo down in the stream, uh, that's my wife, Natalie, who worked for four years as a heritage interpreter and came with us on a lot of these here expeditions to go collect um, original material from the um, different parts of the province. Now, the main part of the story is if you look you can see that little walking stick that he has between my wife, Natalie, and between Roger. Uh, Eldon had fashioned this from a half-inch steel rod. Now, the top part of the rod is only a quarter inch and has a little nut on the end of it. And um, it sort of floats freely from seven to nine inches, maybe. And when he was walking through the woods with this walking stick, he would just go thump, thump, thump. And then every now and then it would go ting, it ring like a bell. And Eldon would move the leaf litter and he'd move the moss and he'd come up with this beautiful vein of agate. Now, when Eldon was doing the geological inventory map, he said, um, he explained it to me in his process. And he must have took a look at me and sized me up as being a pretty big boy. And uh, he said, Charlie goes, the earth is like a layered cake but you can't tell what kind of cake it is because it's got icing on it. He said, the only way you can tell what kind of cake it is, is if you cut out a slice. He said, mother nature has cut out a slice of the earth in the waterways. So what he did to us, he walked up all the waterways. He recorded the changes in geological material and collected um, four samples of everything that he had found, all the different material that makes up Nova Scotia. He was a, uh, He's an amazing man, and uh, we've learned a lot from him. These are some of the sample pieces that we have from Davidson's Cove out on Scotts Bay. And the material is still there. Uh, the evidence of our ancestors who collected this material and flint nap right on site. Even some of the hammer stones that you find that have been used over the years since then, some ancient, some more contemporary. Uh, people still go there and literally littered. And with every tide and when the um, little brook that runs out erodes through and cuts the land, it washes all this stuff out into the sea. So there's uh, literally hundreds of thousands of pieces of material that help tell our story through geology. Um, this is my son and I off on Partridge Island collecting some of the samples. Uh, Kyle's a little older there. He might be 11 or 13. Uh, he definitely put in his time with me some four or five years on the field and literally thousands of kilometers throughout the province. Uh, this is one of the, an example of one of the projects that we had done. This was an artifact that was donated to us from uh, Dollar Lake Provincial Park, which is in behind the Halifax International Airport. That material that it was made from does not originate in um, Halifax County. Now, we had this piece from Migmoy de Burt from the archaeological site. In fact, it was dug up by my son, who worked six years there as uh, an archaeologist for um, uh, his summer job project. He brought that home and he said, Dad, look, I found this. This looks really nappable. And I said, no, man. I said, that's actually a tool. It's a core. Someone had collected that from another area and brought it. And you could see that tools were actually fashioned from that material. So what we had done with Eldon was we took a look at all the artifacts throughout the province, where they originated from or where they were found. And then we looked at the geology of what they were created from and looked at the lithic sources where they originate from. And when we put these down on a map, you could see trade routes and travel ways of our ancestors, definitely telling a big part of our story, even to the point where 
we could actually predict where we were going to find things, especially along the waterways or along the coastline. Uh, this particular one is again from the Davison's Cove collection. And I did a presentation at Bear River First Nation and the chief of uh, Bear River, uh, I should say former chief, uh, Mr. Frank Muse, he gifted me that tool. And he said that he had found it at Grand Lake Flowage. And when you think of Bear River First Nation and the proximity of Grand Lake Flowage, looking at that point, that projectile point, you're saying that originates from the David Cove's uh, Scotts Bay area. So you could see how that material was collected in other areas and brought to native communities and how it ended up in different parts of the province. Uh, even taking a look at some of the samples that we had collected from Davidson's Cove and through um, a digital electronic microscope, you could really get in to see the features of the different materials. Uh, you can see pockets of crystallized quartz that are both found in the point and found in the lithic sample. Uh, bands of crystallized quartz that go through the material also found on the um, lithic material from Davidson's Cove. And even dark areas of black agate, which may indicate heat treatment. If you heat things up, it makes it more, um, uh, it snaps a lot easier and a lot cleaner. So that's basically the process that they're using to flint nap this material was to heat treat it first. Uh, even the light areas that you're finding of the, like uh, chalcedonies or porcelain chalcedonies that are found in both of these samples. So you definitely can tell that that artifact originally came from a stone that came from that quarry site at uh, Davidson's Cove. And again, when you take a look at all the different story sites that we have in the province, and you took a look at the um, minus basin geofracture and the Cubiquid fault lines, uh, there's definitely a connection between our stories and where these lithic materials come from. And what our ancestors were doing was taking traditional knowledge and ecological knowledge, embedding it in story form and passing the stories on. So that way um, the stories definitely had a part of history. Now today our ancestors are looking at them and they're really, really digging into the fine meanings of these stories. And again, like I said, since 1930s, it's been called the Goose Cap Trail. And again, on both sides of the Bay of Minas Basin in the Bay of Funde. And for all of these little yellow dots that you see there, every single one of them is a lithic sources site where material created in these two major fault lines has produced culturally significant material that you could make tools out of. And the thing is, every single one of those sites, I can tell you a glue cap legend about. So again, that information is definitely evident in the uh, Minas Basin and along the glue cap trail. Again, you can see highlighted by two of the largest fault lines in the province, the Cubiquid fault line to the north of the Minas Basin and the Minas Basin geofracture that literally runs from Guysboro County off into Digby Neck and even goes into um, the Bay of Funde and pops up on the shoreline of uh, Maine, uh, right around uh, Portland, South Portland, Maine. And just a few years between Christmas and New Year's, they had a major uh, earthquake there. So it's still active and still rumbles and bumbles a bit. And again, when you think of um, our travel ways and how we get along through the province of Nova Scotia today, uh, it's the road system. And there's no place that you can't travel in the province without finding a road or a path to it. But our ancestors didn't have that luxury. Um, we use the waterways. And again, you can see that the travel routes cover the entire province. And traveling the shorelines and the rivers, you're running into those raw materials and those lithic materials. And again, using canoe to travel the waterways along the shoreline, uh, if you take a look at the Atlas of Nova Scotia, the map book of Nova Scotia, and you take a look at the gazetteer in the back of the book, there's 13 places in Nova Scotia called Black Rock. And Black Rock is literally volcanic basalt. When you go to these places, you're going to find cultural significant material that was created by the changes in geology. And our ancestors who were paddling along the waterways, along the shorelines and stuff, would see these outcrops 
as places that the creator left gifts for us. And these black rock um, places and volcanic basalts were very, very significant to uh, our gathering of materials. Um, you take a look at uh, Arasag, that, that volcanic basalt that's coming out from the water. Uh, if you ever have the luxury of getting out there on a boat, you can literally see columns that form as a, underneath the Earth's crust, there's little crevices that these things are building up. And it's like driving through all these different columns of basalts that come right up. It's very hard to navigate the water straight outside of uh, Arasag. And uh, again, you can see that our ancestors have definitely been going there collecting beautiful material. Uh, Briar Island, way down off of Digby Neck, you've got what's called columnar basalts that have created desirable material, both for flint napping as well as stone ground tools like our chisels and our axe heads and uh, different adzes for creating um, like even canoes. I mean, there's a lot of use from this material. Uh, Cape Shigmecto, all the other matrixing material that encrusts it has been eroded by the world's highest tide and you're left with these columns of straight volcanic basalt. Uh, Cape Door, again, you see the columnar basalts that are coming up. Uh, Horseshoe Cove, beautiful place to go get agates and material for flint napping. Um, even Scott's Bay, these are uh, what's called considered pillow basalts and they're sort of rolling in, into the water and cooling in these little round pouches and pockets. I actually found a piece of um, uh, material there that looked like a massive egg sac, like a polywog egg sac. And you could break off each one of these little nodules. And when you snapped it, there was little geodes inside. They were cooling in the water and forming these bubbles. And the crystallization grew from the walls. And uh, depending on the heat of the stone and the material, as well as the cooling temperature, it gives you the quality of the, um, the geodes that you find. Um, these ones were kind of poor in quality. They weren't as sharp and crisp. Uh, some of them rounded off on the insides, the way that it crystallizes. Eldon used to sell them in his shop for like five to eight bucks. And you could actually just have these little uh, balls and, um, of stone that you could crack yourself to see what was inside. Uh, geodes, uh, definitely a good place to go to see those there. And uh, again, Cape Split, we talked about the volcanic basalts that are there at the Rays Beach. Uh, Partridge Island, again, talked about uh, all the different story sites from there and the material that uh, you're getting. Uh, Five Islands, a legendary story of giant beaver and the lithic material that's created there that our ancestors collected. And again, that's what it's all about is the geology. That's what we use in order to survive here. And then when you think that certain places in Nova Scotia are literally littered and covered with this stuff, um, you didn't have to travel too far before you found something that you could use. And even uh, the cultural significance sites that we have, this is uh, collecting at Cape Door. It was take your son to work day, uh, grade uh, nine. And uh, a lot of the kids didn't want to go to work with their parents. They said, I want to go with Kyle's dad. So I'm like, sure. <laughs> and uh, took them out to Cape Door where we collected material. Now, if you take in material from anything, culturally, you have to leave an offering. My son, Kyle, and his friend, Marcus, um, leaving an offering uh, from my medicine pouch where we, we would put stuff. Marcus actually said, who's going to know, like, you know, if we don't make an offering? He said, we're hundreds of kilometers from anybody. And he said, no one sees us. And I said, Marcus, I said, turn around. And when he turned around, the cliffs are definitely looking back at us. I was like 80 feet, 100 feet of cliff face. And you can definitely see the face of people inside there watching out from the landscape. These are sites of cultural significance that produce material of cultural significance. So they're still special to our people here. And even a lot of these stories and lessons that we have are led and guided through the Elders Advisory Council. Uh, some of the, uh, our Elders Advisory Council is made up mainly of educators. And we've got everyone from the center as um, Elsie Charles Bass. She was the first Mi'kmaq to receive a teaching degree. And she just uh, passed away some one month away from her 100th birthday. And uh, we have lost a couple members of our Elders Advisory Council. But again, it's their teachings that uh, 
we are looking to put into the stories to tell at the Mi'kmaq Moi Bird Cultural Center when it gets built. And when you're traveling along the um, shorelines looking at this material from the cultural sites, everybody walks over the stuff and they just see it as a rock. It's like, yeah, it's just a rock. It's like, yeah, but if you know what you're looking for and you take that rock and cut and polish it, this is the beautiful material within. And it's those agates and amethyst, the semi-precious jewels with a hardness of eight to eight and a half uh, that really, really make beautiful uh, tools uh, that our ancestors had um, collected and fashioned into the tools that we use to survive here. That was terrific, uh, Gerald. Thank you so much for sharing all of your insights that you've, you've gathered over the years. Thank you so much. Well, if you have any corrections, I'd appreciate those too. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we won't around telling the wrong things that people have told me. Uh, no, yeah. uh, no the, you, you've, you've dedicated so much uh, time and, and energy to, to bringing these stories uh, back to, to, to the rocks and the area and, and also sharing that, those stories with us. And it's, it's really wonderful. Um, I was, um, about the raised beaches, I was thinking about how that, you know, the land has been moving up and down right? with the ice. It was pushed down and then right. uh, subsided. And when the, when the glacial ice uh, left, it, it rebounded and pushed those beaches back up, you know, well, not only ten, over 10,000 years. Yeah. Not only is it raising and falling, but it's also tipping. Right. And um, we have samples of some of the, um, the rings that were fashioned along the stones and again, they would be to tie your boat up. And it's yeah. like, those would have been above sea level at one point. Now they're three yeah. or four feet below the sea level. Yeah. I don't know if that's a rise in sea level or a lowering of the land, but it's like right. Nova Scotia is tipping. So, right. yeah. Yeah, we don't, you know, it's, it's kind of striking for us to think about the land that feels so rigid and, and the ground underneath our feet, that I, but it actually is quite uh, flexible. And, and when you have two kilometers of ice on it, it gets pushed down Wait. and then oh, yeah. and comes back up. Um, and that that perspective that you're able to give of the, the Mi'kmaq history and that that longer period of time where we uh, would know the climate has changed, you know, changed significantly with the, the ice. Uh, so these are stories of, of actual observed climate change and um, probably, you know, helpful for us to consider as we move forward into this new uh, concept of and adapting ourselves. Well, when I was with Department of Natural Resources, we went to a conference in the 80s, 1980s. And that's when um, global warming and climate change was still a tree huggers myth. <laughs> and uh, they had the foresight actually to bring in the Mi'kmaq elders from Cape Breton. And they asked what the Mi'kmaq felt of um, climate change. And one of our elders, who's on our elders advisory council, actually took the podium. Mm -hmm. And she said that in a verb-based language, we have things that are very specific to certain times of the year. That's where we get the names of all of our months. Every month is named after something that goes on in the environment, as well as certain objects and things that you find. She said, we have June bugs in May. We have May flowers in April. And we have April showers in March. Everything's out of whack. Everything's out of sync. And that, you could just see that light bulb moment where people were like, uh, even a Mi'kmaq month for November is kept to Kewikus. And that literally translates to the times the rivers freeze. And they don't freeze in November anymore. No. Like, I'm, I was born, like, you know, in the 50s. When I was a kid in the 60s, we used to go skating before Christmas. And like, huh. you can't skate the brooks or lakes and before, like, you know, now. So I can even see it just in my lifetime. It's, like, right. it's happening very fast. So um, I'll just pass it over to Luke. If you have any questions, uh, I might come back and ask you a couple more as well. Sure. Sounds good. Um, I was yeah. wondering when and why you got interested in geology. Um, what, I, what I did with Department of Natural Resources was I was a program development officer for um, projects like Project Learning Tree and Project Wild. And whenever I talked about nature and I talked about the environment, that Aboriginal part of me kept coming out. And one of the guys at the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq, he's my boss, Tim Bernard, he saw one of my presentations and he said, buddy, you don't belong there. You don't, 
you belong with us, he said, telling our story. And that was back in uh, 20, 2005. So I've just been there 15 years. That's when the transition was made from natural resources to Aboriginal culture. And uh, it, was, it was always there. Um, we, my father was a forester, so I knew everything about the trees. Uh, we owned a basket shop, so I knew a lot about traditional material that we gathered. And the thing is, um, we lived in a Mi'kmaq community right here in the Bay, traveled to different places to collect things at certain times of the year. It's always been part of our family. And when I was born, I was born with a hole in my heart. So I didn't grow up in my home with my brothers and sisters. I grew up next door with my grandmother and there was no cultural generation gap. I grew up with a, like a kid from the 20s or 30s using <laughs> traditional material and gathering traditional material, not only for my grandmother, but even for her friends were, were too old to go out and harvest. She'd basically tell me like, you know, what do you need? And it's like, even if it's something as simple as uh, boughs to make Christmas wreaths, to sell the Christmas wreaths for money so you could buy Christmas presents. Like I was that yeah. kid. It's like, uh, yeah, always been that kid. <laughs> so now, now my kids are doing that for other people here. Uh, one of our basket people, um, she produces porcupine quill work on birch bark. Uh, my two sons went out and collected um, the last batch of birch bark that she ever had to, um, you know, before she passed away. And she was selling them on the powwow series. So, yeah, always contributing to the community and to the elders. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, and what's your favorite uh, mineral or gem to collect? Um, just agates. Like I said, depending on the the source mi minerals that are inside, gives you a different variety of colors. Uh, agates are beautiful, and like I said, you you cut and clean and polish them up. Uh, they actually have value, and uh, yeah, and even knowing where to find them and finding them when you go. It's almost like your own little secret. <laughs> and it's like, uh, you don't tell anybody where your favorite agate sites are, but uh, agate would be my greatest material. And again, I know tons of spots. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, well, thank yeah, you very I'm much. Very much. Oh, you're very welcome. <laughs> and Gerald, you, um, uh, you shared a lot of your artwork and drawings in your presentation, yes. and thanks for sharing those. And that's a, <laughs> that's a big part of your, your work and what you do is uh, and drawing and visualizing. And, um, yeah. So thanks for sharing those. But uh, maybe we can look forward to uh, in the coming summer or fall um, maybe doing a field trip ourselves and, and going out and, oh, yeah. and uh, looking for some, some that new I interesting would look forward rocks. to. Okay, yeah. that's great. Been dreaming about that all winter and just waiting <laughs> to get back out of there. Okay. Well, we'll leave it there, Gerald, and thank you so much for sharing your, your insights to, with us today. That was a wonderful presentation by Gerald, and really interesting to see the, the history of the discovery and study of uh, artifacts here in Nova Scotia. Uh, today, and since 1980, the archaeological artifacts and fossils are protected in Nova Scotia by the Special Places Protection Act. Uh, you would need a, a heritage research permit in order to go and look for fossils and collect them. Um, and similarly for archaeological work, you would need a research permit. Um, but if you happen to see something uh, on your travels or that you come across and you're interested in trying to determine if it's significant, you can take a photograph and um, certainly send it to the museum for uh, more information. and. We're always interested to, to hear uh, about what things you might have found.